this is Harriet Grayson, your host and producer for Community Culture Showcase. And I have a fabulous guest today who's going to talk about a period in time, the Civil War era, in ways that you have not had any information. This guy knows everything, and beside that, he dresses for the part. And he and I are going to share um, a stage of sorts on next Tuesday, on October on October 23rd at 7 p.m. at the Malted Barley upstairs there. We're going to talk about, he's going to do a whole enactment for us, and you're going to love it. So I want you, with great pleasure, I want you to meet James Littlefield. And Jim, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got involved in all of this wonderful stuff that you're doing. Okay, well, it's all, it's nice to be here with you, Harriet. I appreciate you inviting me. and. Uh, this reenacting, which is this is oh of, wonderful! <coughs> you are dressed for the day. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, it was something I, my wife and I, and I got involved in around 2003. Um, we belonged to a Southern Civil War unit called the First Maryland. Uh, I was the resident blacksmith at the time. My wife was a period portrait painter, and we went all over the state with the First Maryland and, and, and doing uh, presentations. So right. that's how I, I got started with this part of history. I mean, I was a history teacher yes. for 48 years, but yes. <laughs> it's a lot more fun dressing up as a history <laughs> character uh, and doing things in Southern accent, and, and, and that, that the creative piece of right. it was a great thing. It wasn't right. just the curriculum. The curriculum's still there with reenacting but it's a little bit differently uh, uh, um, done. So anyway, we started doing that. And then as time went on, uh, when I started doing the character that I'm gonna do here today, um, I started to uh, do a slave catcher mm -hmm. because my wife and I bought a, a bloodhound. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I started doing a little bit of research into the bloodhound breed and found that they were very important in, in the peculiar institution. Mm -hmm. So uh, Miss Molly uh, at my side uh, became my, uh, I, I, I traded in my blacksmithing tongs and my apron <laughs> and my and my fire and all my bituminous coal, all that stuff. And, uh, and I became a slave catcher. I will say, one of the things that I did that was smart early on is I quickly went from a slave catcher to an ex-slave catcher. No, yes. Because yes. When, you are in, when you're in character, <clears throat> you have to be in the time. Mm -hmm. So the last thing I want to be doing here is I want to be uh, questioning an African-American, you know, why they are there without a pass mm -hmm. from the plantation, which would have been the case in 1863. Right. So if I say, okay, I'm an ex-slave catcher, right. I can talk about what it was like when I did that. Mm -hmm. but there's an emancipation, there's, there's a, a 13th Amendment, there's a lot of things that have happened which have changed. I don't do those things anymore, but I'll tell you about it. Right. So that gave me an opportunity to uh, to put that in a light that was a little more palatable. I did not want to be defending slavery, mm -hmm. you know, to, to, to an audience. Right. Um, so I did try to, to make that a kind of a past tense thing, and I've done it that way since, and it's worked out well. I mean, I've been, there are there are places that I haven't been able to go, and there's mm -hmm. people that have canceled programs because they thought this was something <clears throat> that different than it was. Mm. Um, this is very, I think, very informational, and I think it's, uh, um, you know, very realistic and historic. It's not meant to be, um, you know, racially uh, charged mm -hmm. or anything mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we'll do a couple of things during the course of it, and, you know, you can be the judge, but... Uh, right, right. Um, when you were teaching history, was your focus of concentration the Civil War? Never. Never. Al almost never. I think I taught Eurasian history for 13 years in middle school, and then I went to the high school and I taught um, uh, ancient history. <laughs> <coughs> so once in a while they would give me an American history uh, piece, mm -hmm. and usually it was, it was more the modern American piece. So that was a kind of the elective, and of course I taught anthropology for a lot of years. But uh, no, I, I just didn't have uh, any great interest in the Civil War. Um, uh, my father was was a World War II pilot. Uh, he hated the Civil War mm. because he said uh, there was nothing glorious about it. There was nothing, we were tearing ourselves apart. Um, 
he did give me a wonderful artifact from the time, an 1862 Springfield rifle that hangs over my, uh, oh. that's the iconic uh, weapon of that time period, it hangs over one of our many fireplaces in the house. But uh, no, I didn't have any, any real love. And of course, the institution of slavery uh, is so horrible uh, mm. that I really didn't want to be involved in that. So when I got the the track and the bloodhound, I, st I, I wanted to be a bounty hunter more mm -hmm. than I wanted to be a slave catcher, but it was unavoidable. Right. It was un that was the Negro dog. That's what it was called. Uh -huh. So there's no dodging that. No, I, I went after uh, uh, people that escaped the plantation. That's right. my job. I can tell you what I made and I can tell you how tough it was, but or, yeah, in the past. Yes, yes, uh, yes. So that's the kind of, of thing that I, that I started doing. So is where's your historical roots personally? Your family's from around here, my, your family's from the South. Right. I, I'm, I'm proud to say, I mean, I've lived in East Lyme my whole life. Mm -hmm. And when people talk about, you know, their families being there or them moving in early in the 50s or whatever, my family moved in in 1861. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got the name of the boat that, uh, you know, John and his wife came in on, and they came from Block Island. Oh. So my family is a Block Island family. If you go out to Block Island, there's a lot of little fields out there. Oh, okay. I mean, the cemetery is filled with them. And the, the beekeeper and the taxi cab driver and everybody's a little field or knows a little field. So there's an awful lot of them there. So uh, my family came in 1861 and they purchased uh, Rocky Neck. It was called the Rocky Neck Farm. Mm. So we lived there. Uh, and I, was, I lived there in the 1950s on the last hundred acres of little field property until eminent domain <coughs> came our way and all of a sudden we were removed. So we lived there for a hundred years. Mm. And uh, so that was my, uh, I, I'm, I'm a long time East Lyme person. My family comes from there. My dad, you know, everybody was, we, my, my grandfather had a, a service station from mm. 1917 up till 1958. Uh, and that's, by the way, that rifle that mm -hmm. Civil War rifle, he took it in trade during the Depression. Oh, for, from <laughs> for services from, so rendered. <laughs> interesting, interesting. Yeah, yeah, so I was telling uh, yeah. off camera, we were talking <coughs> that my father's family mm -hmm. comes from Baltimore, mm -hmm. um, and that my recollections of 1950s Baltimore was this completely segregated place. Mm -hmm. And my father went to only white schools. We would go visit and go to Woolworths, and mm -hmm. there were no black people there at all. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it isn't until Brown versus the Board of Education in the 1950s, 1954, mm -hmm. I think it was, that in fact there was a move to actually integrate the Baltimore school system. Hmm. So, you know, Maryland was a border state, mm -hmm. but it had, as you know from your enactment, there was a, there was a southern piece of it, mm -hmm. and then there was the northern interest mm -hmm. piece in it. So that, so what attracted you to the kind of the Maryland first, which is in fact the regiment that you did your enactment? Well, some of our friends were involved ah, in it. okay. Yeah, and so that's why, how we kind of got involved in it. But it's funny how you mentioned Maryland and how you mentioned Maryland as being a slave state. Uh, because I did, I did bring this along, and right. it's, a, <clears throat> it's a slave collar, and uh, it says right on it, Simmons and Cox, Tobacco and Negroes, uh, Baltimore, Maryland, 1842. Right. Um, this went around the neck of a human being. Uh, it went around the neck of a human being, and uh, my wife cried when mm. I brought it home. Uh, it's a great artifact but it's a, it's a terrible reminder. I, and I, you talk about racism. I mean, I remember racism here. I don't think there were any uh, black individuals that lived in East Lyme when I grew up there. Mm -hmm. We went to New London High School in high school. And so that became a little different. That was our first experience, interracial experience. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it was pretty much a segregated, uh, blue collar, white, uh, parochial kind of, uh, of neighborhood. That's the way it was. And I, in talking with you earlier, I did mention um, that my family had actually owned slaves. I didn't know the particulars until a few weeks ago when my brother sent me the will of Caleb Littlefield in 1767. Mm. And on that listing w were the names uh, Desiree, Bazella, Martha, Sarah, uh, Minter, Timothy, Hamilton, and Jethro. 
And I remember, I tried to memorize them right. because they were pieces of property in 1767. Mm -hmm. And they were people. Mm. People, like a right. real person had that around their neck. Right, exactly. Um, and I want, to, I want to always be able to remember that. But here is, here is one family, Caleb Littlefield. This is his will and testament. He's giving members of his family uh, different slaves. Now, there are eight of them that I just mentioned, and they are going to different families. And one of the things that they always talked about up here, the North did, is how horrible the South was to separate human families. Well, we did it here. Right. We right. did it here. And here's another thing. Two of those names were... Uh, uh, listed as mulatto ch uh, children. Mm. Now, where did that white uh, seg uh, segment come from? Sure. Who, who donated that? My guess is the people that owned the slaves. So I I'm, I'm very hesitant to ever get up on my high horse and proclaim right. that I was on the side of right or my people were on the side of right. And I think that people that do do that maybe should be a little more careful Right. Ab about that because right. uh, you can, okay, you might find a hero in your family tree, but you're going to find some people that, uh, you know, uh, were not. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, even with the things that we do, so many times people will kind of brush over uh, some of the things that uh, maybe they, they did weren't so good, but they'll tell you all about the wonderful <laughs> thing they did. And, and I just think that that's one of the things I think I did, Harriet, in the, in the book, The Promise, and also in the first book I did about slavery, which was A Slave Catcher's Woman. I tried to tell the truth mm -hmm. as much as the truth is possible. Right. I mean, I, 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 I think it was Einstein that said, a uh, person who thinks they have the truth will be shipwrecked by the laughter of the gods. <laughs> so, you know, I know we try to, 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 to say, you know, say things as we see them and as we record them, uh, but a lot of times they're told to us by people and they're, they, you know, they, they kind of pass the test. Sometimes they don't pass the test. Be real careful with well, it, well, lots of people want to smooth out those rough edges that might be in yeah. the family tree right. and right. sort of overlook. Yeah. But of course, we were talking earlier that New England mm -hmm. was, in fact, had a great many slaves, and that uh, I live in Westerly, Rhode <coughs> Island, mm -hmm. the state of Rhode Island was Good actually Lord. a huge made a huge amount of money from the slave trade. Uh, absolutely. And I, I remember t uh, telling a, a group one time that, um, you know, as a, as a person from the South, I just want you to know that those slave ships that were off the African coast were not from Alabama. Mm. They were not from Georgia. They were not from uh, Virginia. They were from Rhode Island and Connecticut and Massachusetts. Those were those were the people that brought the Africans to our shore. It's true that uh, slavery, the slave trade, was abolished in 1808. And it, but if you look at some of the New England states like Connecticut, I don't think they abolished slavery until mid 1800s. So and they were slow to to do some of those things, right. you know. And there's plenty of evidence. Of, uh, of, of slavery up here, uh, whether it's the plantation uh, by the Salem ice cream place that was there. <laughs> Samuel Brown had a hundred slaves up there. Uh, that's a plantation. That's yes. not, a, it, usually what people will say, Harriet, is they'll say, well, oh, okay, yeah, they had a couple of slaves up here, and, but they were like family, and, and uh, they only had one or two, or, well, Caleb, I just read off <laughs> eight. Right. Eight that were infused with white blood and were split up as a family. So, I mean, let's let, let, the South in the Civil War looked at the North as extremely hypocritical. You started this thing, and because it wasn't profitable, you gave it up. Mm -hmm. It was very profitable for us, and you want to take away our living. And, you know, obviously it was a horrible thing, and, and it, it's a good thing it ended. But you can see maybe why they fought it especially when somebody is wagging their finger 
uh, right. from the north uh, in their direction. Yes, yes. No, it's, it, it's, it's mind-boggling because we were talking about how they sometimes camouflaged it out of the whole fish, the whaling kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. They just sort of hid it and turned out to be, they weren't looking for whales. They right. were carrying human cargo. Right. No, even out of New London. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I don't remember now. It's been a while since I've talked about this, but uh, I, I remembered the I, I used to talk about three ships in particular that carried, uh, uh, that went out of New York, out of uh, New London Harbor and, and went out uh, in Africa and brought back slaves. They were supposed to be whalers, but they weren't whalers. Right. They were disguised. Uh, and this was after 1808, so what they were doing was illegal at the time. Mm -hmm. They were trying to hide right. it, exactly. But there's so many examples of, uh, um, I remember doing a presentation one time up in Canterbury, and I happened to mention um, Godfrey Malbone, who, <laughs> who was, I think, the number one slave, might have been the number one guy in New England, mm -hmm. I, I think he was. And uh, I was in his territory. I was in his, he was buried in the church <laughs> out in back that I was talking. <laughs> but what was great is they knew him. They knew what he did. Yes. He was still theirs, but guilty as charged. Right, you know? right. But, yes. uh, there, so there was, there was plenty of representatives of, of uh, uh, the slave, people who owned slaves and, mm -hmm. and uh, businesses that uh, depended on slaves. And in, in um, Hempstead Diary, there's plenty of examples of him and, uh, uh, of slavery. Sure. Uh, John Pfeiffer does a great program where he lists all the slaves in the late 1700s. Most slaves disappeared from the landscape here after the American Revolution. In the late 1700s, they start, you know, letting them go. Um, and, they, and it's not profitable either, you mm -hmm. know, so there's a reason for doing that. But, right, it wasn't altruism. Right, to jump on board and say, you know, we were, we were abolitionists, we loved the African American, we really, Connecticut was considered the most, the racist state in New England. Uh, William Lloyd Garrison said it's the Georgia of the North, mm. uh, the land of steady habits. Well, those were racial habits. Right. I remember them in my own community, you know, growing up. So, um, no, the, being on the side of the righteous, you really have to kind of be a little bit careful. I yes, think. yes. <laughs> well, they needed the slaves to move those big boulders. To, to make those miserable little farms that eventually <laughs> turned out that they, they couldn't make they couldn't make a living anyway. Uh, right, hard, hard scrapple farms. Yes, yeah, yes, right. yes, right. yes. So that's so that then then they had to feed them. So why bother keeping them right. if they, it wasn't going to be profitable? And right. So correct. We turn we turn a corner. I mean, there you know, and all, there is a lot of care involved with when you have a a, a human being that is your property that's going to be your beast of burden. I mean, it's going to be, it's going to cost you a lot more than it's going to cost a lot of other beasts of burden. Mm. I mean, that's, of course, that's one of the things the South always used to say, how wonderful the slave masters were mm. to be doing all these great things, taking care of their medical mm. expenses. Their housing was better than blacks had in the North. And they, <laughs> it's funny because when Uncle Tom's cabin came out, they had Aunt Phyllis's cabin. Was, an, was a, a book, and it was exactly the opposite, exactly how wonderful the slaves were treated, which wasn't the case, but right. it was true that they were expensive uh, to keep, but they made a lot of money from them, from so them. Or they right. wouldn't have had them in the first place. Exactly, so. exactly. Yeah. And, and then there is this yeah. discussion that even if, absent of the Civil War, eventually the South would have actually stopped doing slavery because it would not have been... They would have economic. mechanized. Yeah, they would yeah. have mechanized. They wouldn't have needed the people. Right. Exactly, right. exactly. Right. So right. lots of yeah. things happen. It has nothing to do with altruism. But we right. do a very poor job, as you as a teacher know, teaching our history in our, in our schools. Mm -hmm. um, very few people actually have any idea about what went on in the Civil War. Forget about uh, here in Connecticut. They don't know Connecticut's history with it, but they just don't have right. a good feeling for that. And I think that continues even, even to this day where we have misinformation right. and people just really don't have a real sense of what went on. And, I, and I'll, I'll go you one better. Uh, I mean, here, here I was a history teacher, and when I started doing these books, there was stuff I never, I never knew Mm -hmm. I never had a clue, and I know if I didn't have a clue as a history teacher, even though I didn't teach that course as a general rule, I, the average person probably would. For example, I'll give you a good example. 
I stumbled across this, and I put it in this uh, Slave Catcher the Promise. Uh, I did not know that between, <clears throat> let's see if I remember the dates, 1780 and 1880, there were 8,000 recorded medical dissections done in the United States in institutions of higher learning, medical colleges and things mm -hmm. like that. What do you suppose they used for cadavers? <laughs> because the government at the time did not allow any cadavers that were not um, indigents or people that were hung, and there just was not, you could not do that to Uncle Fred who passed away last week. You just right. couldn't do it. So what happened is, I found out there was a whole underground American cadaver trade. Oh, yes. Between $5 and $30 for a... Um, a, 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 an African-American who had been enslaved sold by the plantation owner to get the last pound of flesh, the last bit out of a pound of flesh. Right. And when I read that, I said, and this comes, uh, this scholarship is recent. This is from the 1990s uh, where I, uh, Dana Barry Rain Rainey, I think, was the number one person from the University of Texas. There, once they found this, they pounced on this. Dartmouth, I mean, mm. Harvard. Right. I mean, th th there was hardly any of those wonderful institutions that weren't buying from this institution. Mm. And they started to look around, and they found they found the medical records on hand. They found. Uh, parts of the bodies that were still in brine mm. from the time period. Wow. They found bodies buried out in back of these institutions. So this has only become more of uh, uh, documented with time. It's, it started in the 1990s, but I happened to run into her book and uh, I said, oh my goodness, I said, I'll have to write that into the story. So there's a, a part in the story where uh, Sadie the cook is very angry with someone, one of the plantation mistresses, and starts to uh, scrape some of the uh, uh, some of the lead off the back of an old uh, mirror and starts putting it in the food and kills her. <laughs> but th it was you know, lead poisoning is easily detected, and yes. so she ends up being hung. But the body ends up getting sent to Atlanta uh, for medical dissection. Isn't I just it? tossed that in there because those things were true. So I never heard Underground Railroad? Yes. Yes, yes. <laughs> underground yes. Cadaver Trade? No. No, no. no. It's like mm. the equivalent today of the Underground Organ Trade. Mm. Right? Selling organs. Correct. Poor people selling their kidneys. They only need one. You can be alive and still do that kind of stuff. Right. Interesting. How did you get from history teacher to enactment to author? Um, as a, when I was a history teacher, I used to write a lot of, they used to have me write stuff for, uh, for some reason. And uh, a lot of it was boring stuff. The minutes mm -hmm. of the, not so much the minutes of the meeting, but if something happened that I would write that up. At the end of the year, I would give out all the awards. So I would write stuff up, some little funny things for people. So I, and I used to write up, when I first started, I used to write up my lessons because I was so afraid that I would leave something out. So mm -hmm. I was pretty meticulous and I was always a pretty good writer, even when I was, I wasn't a very good student when I was in high school. Uh, I was always very envious of the uh, people. I got C's and I was, I, I like recess and I like sports and I like music. But outside of that, I, I like running around the Littlefield 100 acre property, but I didn't like the confinements of school. But it was kind of funny when I went back into education, which no one could believe, <laughs> I would look at that kid in the back row and I would say, that's Jim, that's Jim Littlefield uh, 30 years ago and I know what he likes and I know what he doesn't like and I'll bet you I can tell a story or I can come up with something that will engage that person. Mm. <clears throat> so it wasn't maybe so much writing but it was the telling. And so Littlefield's stories became kind of well known and I would, I would time them so that the, the, the bell would go off just just when Rasputin was <laughs> about to do something nefarious, you know, they're about to put him under the ice or whatever, and they would go, oh, no, we've got to wait a whole day? Sorry, oh. have the rest, enjoy the rest of the day. So I didn't have a, a lot of background in writing. In fact, Kappa asked me to do a, uh, uh, a thing on how to write historical fiction. I said, I didn't have written, written historical fiction in my life. I wrote a lot of documents for archaeological digs, but I told a lot of stories, 
and I told, and I, and so I had that, you know, it was a dark and stormy night. I, mean, I had that kind of down a little bit, and so a little it, actor in you, right? Yeah, a little yes, bit. And I had yes. never done that too. I'd never been in a school play, mm -hmm. but but boy, when I got into reenacting, that was a lot of fun. Um, I said this to my wife. I said, I think I understand why a lot of people in Hollywood are uh, have issues. <laughs> I said, you can get so involved in the character that you're doing. You forget about everything else. I mean, you're liable to forget about who you are. <laughs> My wife's funny. She said, Jim will do, go on this character and that character. I don't know who I'm going to wake up with next to in the morning. You know? But it's fun. It's fun doing those characters and <clears throat> doing little pieces of dialogue or, or something from them. And, uh, so that's kind of how I, I guess Sorry. how I, I, I got through those things. I could also tell you that uh, retiring... It it changes things, you know. You're not you got you do have some time, right? And you are. Uh, I'm underfoot. My wife's saying, mm -hmm. "Can't you go play golf?" She never used to say that. <laughs> uh, so I, I did. I had the time, mm. and I had the interest uh, because of the column history matters that I write. I've got a lot of contacts, and so I kind of fell into. Uh, you know, the history guy. I was kind of the history guy. Mm. And so I, I started to um, uh, to do that. And if I'm not dressed like this, I'm dressed more like Indiana Jones going mm. around talking about uh, uh, the, the, the archaeology. The great things we, yes. great things yes. we found over 17 years of locally digging. So that is that's wonderful. Um, what's the inspiration for your lead character i mean you're dressing the part but what's what's the inspiration okay i think the reason that we had this we, by by getting molly this bloodhound dog mm. uh i came up with a character uh that would be a slave catcher and i picked coswell tims i used that i got the name from a number of different uh roles a uh, civil war roles I never saw the name Coswell Timms, but I did see the name Coswell, which I really liked. It's very homey, and mm -hmm. I wanted a one-syllable last name, and I found that one in a Civil War dead thing. So I kind of combined the names. Okay. I said, I'm going to be Coswell Elias Timms. Uh, that's what I'll, what I'll be. Now, what kind of guy am I going to be? That, that was one of the things I had to decide, and that decision was made for me uh, when I stumbled across a man named Bill Arp. Now, I don't know if you've ever heard of Bill Arp, but no. if you've ever heard of Mark Twain, you, mm -hmm. people should have heard of They knew each other. They were friends. Oh, they used okay. to use birthday presents. They swapped back and forth. Bill Arp, Major Charles Henry Smith, was the voice of the South from the Civil War to the, through the early 1900s. I want to say he died in 1903, 1905 maybe. But during that time, he wrote for many different periodicals, <clears throat> and he wrote about the war, and he wrote about Reconstruction, and he mm. wrote about life in a farm afterwards. I loved this man. I, 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 promised, I visited his grave. I promised him I'd write a book. Of, if I live long enough, I, I'm going to live up to that promise. Bill Arp was a gentleman who had a wife that he adored, they were married forever. Her name was Octavia. He called it her his his beautiful Tavy. Mm -hmm. He and Tavy lived on a farm. Yet, and they did have Negro slaves. They had ten children that lived, two that died, a grandchild that was actually buried in the same coffin mm -hmm. when he died because mm -hmm. she died two days uh, after he did. Mm -hmm. Put them in the same thing. I visited up in Cartersville, his his grave. Mm. Uh, when I, and I'll tell you about that going down to the south. It was a wonderful trip. And, uh, but I, I told the gentleman that I went down to visit, Hugh Harrington, i got to go to Bill Arp's grave. He is the voice of Coswell Timms. He's the man I wanted Coswell to be. He's, in many ways, the man I always wanted to be. Mm -hmm. He is... He looks a little like Colonel Sanders. Right, right. You know, he's got that. And you, you see pictures of him in, in his books. He's sitting back with his legs crossed on the porch. Uh, maybe he's got a pipe in his hand, maybe he do, doesn't. But he's talking about the little things in life. He's talking about the kids, you know, the, the kids put a harness on the goats and they had the, <laughs> the wagon and the goats went crazy and, oh my goodness, the whole machine broke down. I mean, and the way that he would tell these stories, 
the, the kinds of homespun that he would come up with became the language of Coswell Timms. So when we read something on, uh, you know, you'll, you'll hear uh, the, that voice and you'll hear Bill Arp loud and clear. Uh, I, just, I just love the Southern draw. I love, I love the way the, um, uh, it pays out slowly. Uh, the, the, it has a kind of a nice syntax, kind of a nice, um, in the north you speak very fast, and in the south, you know, it ambles along nicely. And it, maybe you get there, maybe you don't, but it's, it's, the, it's the journey when, when people are talking, uh, more so than it's the, the point you've got to get right now and write it down. And Is you know. there an, did you hear an audio of, of, of uh, his <laughs> stuff that you could actually know, just from no. the writing? Well, just from the writing, but I'll tell you, there was an audio thing involved, too. When I wanted to do the character, I wanted to do the character in Southern dialect and, because I thought it would be effective. Mm -hmm. I never did it as a blacksmith or any mm -hmm. of the other things, but I, I said, if I'm going to be the slave catcher, I want to do the Bill Arp, and I want to do it in Southern accent. So I had a friend um, named Pat Caudle who uh, I had known for a number of years, and he was from North Carolina. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said to Pat, I said, Pat, you know, how about teaching me, you know, how to you know, speak? I, I like the way, you know, I like listening to you. And he said, I tell you what, he says, take your speech. And he says, put the speech down uh, on paper. And he said, I got a little handheld tape recorder. And he said, I will, I'll uh, do it in Southern dialect. And I'll give it to you. And you can practice it. So, so I, I did that. And I worked on it, I worked on it. I didn't want to sound like Gomer Pye. I, I wanted to make sure that it was a legitimate Southern accent. Right. So I taped myself doing this slave catcher program. Right. I sent it to my friends down in Georgia. Mm. One of them's a very uh, real hardcore reenactor. The other one's a writer of a lot of books in Central Georgian history. So I sent it down there and I waited for an evaluation. I, mean, oh. I, I was nervous about it. So it came back, and they sent it back to me, and they said, acceptable southern accent, not Georgian. Oh. Sounds Carolinan. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, Pat Cloud was from North Carolina. But uh, I'll do something for you if you want. I'll, I'll, I'll sure. Do, uh, let me do, I did something for Tom one time, and I did something at the uh, Connecticut Authors and Publishers. But this might be uh, something that Coswell Timms might have done, introducing the Civil War. And this is the way he might, he might look at it. <clears throat> Anybody that's lived any length of time and probably is quite aware that life can sure get boring and, and, and pretty much the same thing day in and day out. Uh, folks get tired of eating the same vittles at the same table and shooing off the same flies and kicking at the same dog under the, under the table. Uh, but I have a feeling that most of these folks have a strong hankering to be part of something bigger, something exciting that might just, might just come their way. Uh, I know for a fact that uh, I would have loved to have seen Vesuvius spill over the top and swallow up them two Roman cities so long ago. Uh, of course, I'd like to be a fair distance away when it happened, I'll tell you that. Uh, I'd, I'd like to feel the, the shake of a genuine earthquake, but be a mile or so from the crack. Now, one of them twisting, turning tornadoes might be something that I would fancy, maybe, maybe even being up inside the thing, but if I, only if I'd lived to tell about it. And uh, maybe many of us thought about a shipwreck at sea, but wouldn't we want it to be uh, hit a rock close to shore and everyone be rescued? You see, I have a feeling that uh, people have to be very careful what they wish for uh, because it's just liable to come their way. And uh, this war, this civil war, this uncivil war, this late unpleasantness, this catastrophe that my wife and my family were forced to endure, I would tell you it cured us of any such fanciful and, and, uh, and uh, fanciful notions. Uh, so that's something that Coswell might say. Notice that he's introducing the civil war. But he's doing it kind of as it affects him and the people he knew. And it's not, he's not telling you about uh, politics. In fact, he, he, would, uh, he would say something like this. He would say, life ain't about 
politics and it ain't about uh, uh, wars and principalities or empires. It's all about the simple family fireside. That's what it's all. That's where life's played out. And that, I believe that's true. Mm. I, and that's what Bill Arp would say. And, uh, and I would listen. And I would put those words into Coswell's mouth. Even though he was a, a slave catcher, you know, and, and, you know, he had a, a not so good, unsavory <laughs> lifestyle. But he would, he would, he had a sense of humor. And he was, he was really trying to do the right thing. It was legal, yes, of course, yes. and he, he made that point. It put food on the table. Uh, it gave his, his neighbors a chance to go about their business with everything being quiet and serene. You know, so he had all kinds of, you could say maybe they were excuses, rationale, like we all do. Yes, make, yes. But um, he did it in such a way and talked about it in such a way that um, people kind of gravitated. I, we know Terry Norris, uh, you mm -hmm. know, from Capital. Right. And she wrote a great recommendation for this book. And she said, basically, I hate this stuff. I don't like the Holocaust. Yeah. And I don't like slavery. And I don't like man's inhumanity to man. But she says, you know what? I listened to Coswell Timms. He drew me in. He was a slave. He drew me in. And he held my hand. And I feel richer having done it. It was a great great endorsement i put mm -hmm. it on the back of the book yes. because the the trouble with most th most things harriet i think tw what movies like 12 years a slave they make they make black people angry and white people feel guilty and they don't do what you want it to do it doesn't sell the ideas behind the dynamics you need somebody that you can trust by your side when you go to these mm. B bad places in history. I mean, there's a reason why all of those death camp those death camps are still around in, mm, in Europe. Right. You know, we got to have those reminders. So Coswell kind of he kind of comes into people's lives. He takes them through this. He loves his dogs. Who doesn't mm. love their dog? <laughs> and you know, we can talk about bloodhounds forever because I'd love to talk about Molly. I love to talk about training them because that's a was a big part of my my kids' programs when I would talk about that because they all love dogs. And, uh, we, and but anyway, I think Coswell sneaks up on you, and that's a great question you ask because he came about through the, you know, through this the thing of Bill Arp. That's the man I want to sound like. That's the man I want to mm. I want to teach lessons through. So, interesting, yeah. interesting, and and. And so you've adapted to this kind of North Carolina draw, uh, drawl, is that? I, I, I stay in Georgia because I'm okay. familiar with the central part of Georgia. Okay. Uh, I, uh, Georgian accent is a little different. Mississippi is a little different. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, El uh, but I'm okay with the accent that I have. Okay. It, it's legitimate. In fact, I got asked to speak down in central Georgia at the, at the old state capitol mm -hmm. where they seceded from the Union. Right. And uh, Hugh Harrington, I'll, I'll tell you who he is in a second, he had arranged this and they were going to pay for my flight down there and I was going to do this presentation and they called about a month before and said, it's too volatile, we can't do it. <laughs> we tried growing cotton, a little cotton by the rail station and we had both blacks and whites were incensed mm -hmm. over what it represented. So we can't have a slave catcher. We thought it was going to be a good idea because Hugh uh, made a big pitch for it, but uh, he says, we can't have you, sorry. Mm. That was the, uh, and, and I would have spoken at the place where Georgia seceded mm. in 61. Interesting. Uh, Interesting. So Georgia, I'm, I'm familiar with. I, I, uh, I had to find a place where this story, Slave Catcher, could, could, could happen. have its, could yes. happen. Yes, yes, yes. And in reenacting, one of the things you always are careful about is picking a place, a site where something's going to happen. Because if you pick Baltimore, like you were talking about Baltimore, there's three people in that audience that know Baltimore like the back of their hand. So some point, they're going to say, do you remember Fred's Pizza? <laughs> down? They're going to do that. To yeah. <laughs> so I said, I want to be from Georgia because Georgia was, a Georgia man was a slave man. So that's how close Georgia was associated with slavery. It's right. the deep south. Right. So, you know, it's important that I be from Georgia. Now, where can I be in Georgia? And I said, uh, I never knew Milledgeville was the capital. Nobody ever heard of Milledgeville. They, they never knew that was the capital, the, the antebellum capital, but it was from all the way from back to 1805. So I said, I'm going to make this whole story happen in, uh, there. Nobody will know anything about Milledgeville. 
I mentioned this when I was in school, I was teaching in school, to the history department. And one of the guys that teaches next door to me said, my first wife was from Millage. <laughs> I said, oh, so, so much for that. He actually gave me um, a magnolia leaf from Memory Hill Cemetery. Now, when, once I made that decision, I'm still going, I'm still going with Millageville. That's right, where it's right, all right. going to happen. Because you only will expect two people in the whole world to know where That's it is. That's one of the odds. <laughs> I'm going to beat the odds. So I uh, look online, Millageville, Georgia. Hugh T. Harrington. Hugh T. Harrington. This name, Hugh T. Harrington, comes up again and again because he's like the godfather. He and uh, a guy named Bonner, uh, James Bonner, are the godfathers of Central Georgian history. They've written numerous books oh. and they are well known. So, Patty Brooks from Kappa had once told me, don't be afraid to contact people. You'll be surprised how approachable they might be. So he had, in one of his books, he had a, a website that I got a hold of. And uh, I, t I said, I'm a reenactor from Connecticut. I'm interested, I'm going to do a slave catcher. I'm interested in your area, uh, you know, looking for some dialogue. I couldn't believe it. He could not have been friendlier. Mm. He could not have been more engaging. Whenever I would use one of his characters in a book or in something, that a reenactment, he was always thrilled that he was able to dig this guy up or this, this person up, and then I would present the person to you the give modern life public. To it, I'd right. give life to it. Yes, yes. So we became great friends. Uh, we talk every day, mm. uh, either by phone, even today, and email usually. Right. He's been to Niantic, Connecticut. Right. I've been to Milledgeville, Georgia. <laughs> I went down there when I was going to make the, the jump from reenacting to actually writing a book. He says, you you got to come down here if you're going to write a book. Right. You have to smell it, feel exactly. it, touch it. You uh, have some get of the food. Yeah, you yeah, gotta meet yeah. The people. Exactly. <laughs> So down I, I, I come, I flew, to, I'd never flown alone in my yeah. life. I, I've flown a number of times, usually with somebody that knows what they're doing. Uh -huh. I landed in the Atlanta airport, I, and that's a big airport, yes. and I go into this, the busy section, and I hear, Coswell, Coswell <laughs> Timms, over, over the din of the crowd, and here's this man. I haven't met him personally. So, uh, you know, big hug, and uh, his wife was there. Uh, she's a, a doctor, a doctor, she teaches, taught, taught college, she's retired. Mm -hmm. Dr. Susan uh, J. Harrington, uh, she's written books. She a, a, does a lot of websites for cemeteries and military. I mean, she's a real technologically, she does my website. <laughs> but they could not have been nicer. They had a whole itinerary planned for me. Mm. We went to Bill Arp's grave that I mentioned. Right. And we went to um, uh, the Memory Hill Cemetery where they did the website, they did the tours, they were they were, it was a mom and pop operation, and it's a beautiful, beautiful cemetery, magnolia right. trees, and just... How far is it from Atlanta? Oh, uh, it's, we never, let's see, I'm going to say by car, it was probably an hour. Oh, so it's pretty close. Yeah, it's fairly yeah. close. So okay. Maybe, it might have been just a little bit longer than that, mm -hmm. but yeah, Atlanta's up in the, and, and this is in, right in the center, center part, of Georgia. which... Like Hartford was placed in the center of Connecticut, Milledgeville was placed in the center of Georgia for a reason. I mean, okay. for a reason, kind of a right. central, central thing. But he had an itinerary for me that was wonderful as far as learning about the Civil War and learning about what happened there. Mm. Uh, we went to a place called Sparta, um, and there was a plantation there that was in its original form. Uh, and, you know, we had the VIP treatment. Mm. They, had, they had the slave quarters mm. uh, and the, the guy that was that owned it, he said, I don't know what I'm going to do with this. He was getting older. He said, I don't mm. know what I'm going to do with it. He said, my kids don't want it. He said, I'm hoping Ted Turner will buy it when I die. <laughs> he said, it's perfect. I mean, it's perfect for a movie setting and uh, everything else. But he yeah. said, if a lot of the people in this area knew this existed, they'd burn it down. <laughs> Which made me a little nervous because <laughs> that people would would do that with their with their past. Mm -hmm. But uh, we had a, a wonderful time visiting. He told me uh, uh, black women that visit from uh, the colleges in, around Georgia, they, they use that for an educational thing a lot. Mm. More than any other group have the toughest time. They just break down in tears mm. around the slave quarters. The women. 
I mean, not that it doesn't happen to uh, men too. To see, you know, when you see these chains, right. and you see these whips, and you right. you 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 visit. This is what happened here. Uh, it was a pretty powerful thing, mm. but you know, we we did go to the Okmulgee uh, burial grounds. Um, uh, up in up in Macon, that's a Native American thing. But <clears throat> we went to a lot of the people in Memory Hill are in the book. Mm. The local prostitute, the sheriff, the mayor, all those people. I, I, I Hugh wrote about them, and I had I had the name of their wife. I had what they died of. I mean, I had all this information. It wasn't really hard to weave it into, into a, a story. Mm. I've had quite a few Village Villians read the book. Mm -hmm. The first one. Oh, okay. The, the second one just came out, but the yes. first one. And they say the same thing. I, I haven't heard people talk like that since I was a kid. That's the one. The slave I, catches woman, right. right? Yes. And I remember I remember that. I remember that. Uh, my parents talking about that, or this event, or that place, or this. And what was really neat, there was a gentleman who was in the movie business. And he was living in a, the home of the doctor, Dr. Fort, who was in my book a lot, the first book. And the gentleman, and he took the slave catcher's woman, and he brought it to the bedside of one of the old, old timers, and he read them that entire story as the man lay there listening. Uh, and he was a, he was a Millage Villian. Right. So here's a Yankee, you know, from up, uh, I mean, I was there for a week. It's uh, not like I lived there. Right. But I had Hugh. And if I wrote a chapter and I, and I was going west in the wagon and he said, you better not go west, there's a swamp there. I mean, he corrected me when I made a mistake. He pointed me in the right direction. And everything, people say, it sounds so real. It sounds, because it is. Yes, it, yes. It, it's all real. In fact, I had people tell me with the first book, you know, you were pretty lucky because you didn't really have to do anything. That's all a slave narrative you found in an old building. <laughs> no, I know it wasn't. <laughs> I saw the old building. I told you that's where that is, but that isn't where it was. It was no such manuscript. You know, that manuscript was manufactured to bring that story to life. So, <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. And it, it, let's see, the, the new book is The Promise. The, yeah. at the, there it is. And is it a continuation of the first story? It is. Okay. The first one goes up to the Civil War. Okay. And uh, it, it has uh, some, some, some things that occur that are really life-threatening. But the war, which is even more life-threatening, is just looming in the background. Mm. And they, the last scene, if you will, there, they're sitting around the fire, just taking in a welcome breath of air, thankful that Cynthia, the wife of Coswell, has been restored to their home, and, and, and Sanford, thank God, is nursed back to health, and this former slave master that did all this damage is no longer uh, around, mm -hmm. uh, and they're, but they're, they're thinking ahead to what's coming, because the political scene is shifting, and they can see what's, what's happening. So this one goes through the Civil War. Ah. But it's, what's interesting, and I did ask in Kappa, I asked a number of people about sequels. And uh, to simply pick up where you left off is simplistic. You can't do that. Mm -hmm. Because I kn the book has to stand alone, and it does. You can read the second one without having read, read the first one. Read the first one. one. Mm -hmm. um, but I do reference things that happened in the book and tell enough about it if I need it and I just leave it kind of dangling if I don't need it, but maybe somebody might want to go back there and find out. I mean, I didn't want to insult somebody that had already read the first, oh, I know that from the first book. Right, you didn't want to repeat yourself too much of the same stuff. It, exactly. Yes, yes. Uh, I so I tried to, I knew there were people that would, that would be joining this Bill Arpian Coswell, uh, Tim's character and his family for the first time, and In I wanted to respect book. that. Yes. And so they, they yep. can start with a clean slate. So. Mm -hmm. It's, this thing starts with um, uh, Coswell, Tim's, the war hasn't started yet. He's out doing one more assignment. He does it all. Mm -hmm. You've got a missing child? Call Coswell. If you've got a, uh, a runaway from the penitentiary, call Coswell. If you've got uh, Sheriff Struthers, uh, somebody robbed the bank, get <laughs> Coswell, get his hounds, get him down there right away. He and his brother, Jesse. Jesse. They're masters of hounds. That's what they're building, the masters of hounds. During the war, Coswell Timms, again, operating in bowder honey fashion, would bring back um, Confederate deserters. Mm -hmm. 25 bucks, pretty good mm -hmm. deal. And there's a lot of them that deserted, so sure. he'd go back, bring them back to the front lines. 
generally they didn't shoot them, they just put them back in uniform. Right, and they needed the bodies. They needed the bodies. Yes. There were 16 prisoner of war camps in Georgia as the, as the North started coming in on the South, so there right. were 16 of them. And uh, they, were run, they were people that escaped from Andersonville was the most mm -hmm. famous one, but there were 15 others. So Coswell, again, you know, some of them had their own dogs, but Coswell would be asked, that was 25 or $30 as well. So he's doing basically anything that a bloodhound, a bloodhound is colorblind. Mm -hmm. Doesn't care if it's black, if it's gray, if it's mm -hmm. blue, or, mm -hmm. or anything, in or black and white prison stripe, it doesn't matter mm -hmm. what color they will attract. And so he's making a pretty good living for himself. So the, that story starts out with him chasing, of all things, a runaway lunatic mm -hmm. from the lunatic asylum. Now, there is a lunatic asylum in Milledgeville. Oh. I've been there, and it's spooky. <laughs> it is a spooky place. It's actually still up. Some of the roof is falling in. They still have guards there, and they have a couple of offices, but there's no more health care stuff. It was once the greatest health care facility in the world in the world, that's what it was billed at. I forget the total number that was there at when it was at its largest. And uh, uh, there was a book written about it, which I, I read, and they said that it, it spoke to some of the, great, the greatest magnitude and some of the greatest depredations of humanity. Mm. So it's a great place for the story to start. Yes, yes. <laughs> so you've got, this, you've got this gentleman who, in a fit of religious passion, has... Uh, attempted to kill most of his family, mm -hmm. and he comes stapled to a cart, and uh, he manages to escape um, in, a, in, a, in a, a thin night shirt, barefoot, with a heavy meat cleaver in his hand. <laughs> so this is not something that anybody wants to run into in the dead of night. And this is this guy is out of his mind. Plus, he has one eye. <laughs> He has, because he, he ripped the other one out in a oh. religious anger, you know, oh. if, if the eye offends you, yes. which he did. Oh. And, so, and he, never had, he never wore a patch. No. So anybody, an any, of the in, any of the um, uh, 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 people that worked in the asylum mm. that had to be near him, they, they, they would shy away in disgust because you could, you could look inside the head oh. with this thing. So he's about as hideous as you can imagine. Right, right. And he escapes. So that piece that I'm going to read for you, with, to you, is about Jesse coming with Dr. Green's news that this guy has escaped. And unlike most of the inmates who are a little more um, docile, <laughs> yes. this one is is just a problem. And if he comes back on the back of the horse, that's okay. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, usually he wants them back so he can treat them. You know, so it starts out, and, and Jesse delivers the news, and Cynthia immediately goes into a funk over it, because the promise is really about it's yeah, it's about I have a bloodhound business, and I promise I'll bring back what you you know whatever's missing, I'll get the job done. But it's really about the couple and what they promise each other, mm. and so this is not a usual job. This the wife sees this as extremely threatening. And she's also got kind of a sixth sense about things, too. So she's always kind of seeing things in advance. And she sees problems. Mm -hmm. And so this first scene, he's, darling, you know, I, I never tell you a bold-faced lie. I mean, he, he says, I love you for good and always. <laughs> I ring safe forever. I mean, he, he goes on with a southern charm. And yeah, if it rains... Red hot railroad tile and butter, boil, boiling tar, tile and boiling tar. Uh, I'll come back to you. So, you know, there's all these promises, but in the back of their mind is th this might be a bad thing, and it almost is. It, it almost is. But that's the lead-in to the Civil War. That mm -hmm. that it doesn't start out with. Uh, you know, uh, Fort Sumter. Is this uh, kind of the symbolism of what's going to happen to the uh, to the South, one-eyed baby? <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't thought of it that way, but there's an awful lot. Yeah, the, the, the story of Coswell Timms runs symbolically mm. because it so happens that Sanford, who is their, uh, their Negro servant, but he's really more of a son to them than anything else, kind of done for show, he ends out being resold into slavery, kind of like Twelve Years a Slave. You know, mm -hmm. you know, he's he's one of those uppity Negroes. You know, that has a because he's competent, 
and certain people can't stand that. So they said, well, we'll take him down a bit, we'll rent him, and we'll sell him into the slavery, into the rice fields of Louisiana. So the day that he is kidnapped is the same day that the Confederates fire on Fort Sumter. Interesting. So I, I tried to balance those off. But again, I, I don't spend a lot of time talking about the battles, although I mention them, but I talk more about the rail cars filled with the people, the empty sleeves and the empty, empty trouser legs that are coming back mm -hmm. to wives who sometimes can't wait for their husband to come home. It doesn't matter. And others say, oh, God, I wow. wish he died mm -hmm. because this is going to be a problem for me. Right. This is wonderful. I mean, we are going to have one wonderful evening. <laughs> you are you put on this show. This is absolutely fantastic. So we're going to be together. I'm It'll be October twenty third, mm -hmm. seven p.m. at the Malted Barley, which is in downtown Westley, forty two High Street. Mm -hmm. We you are going to do this in Ackman. It you'll you'll take an hour. I mean, it, there you got to have the whole show. I no, mean, no, no, is, no, 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 no. It is wonderful, and then. What I'm going to do is present something completely different, mm -hmm. but um, so my character, who I'm going to do a, a, a performance piece that I wrote mm -hmm. about Sasha Perloff, mm -hmm. who is my New York City police detective, who was born in Russia, uh -huh. and whose mother was a Soviet dissident, and who in fact was tortured. And he is the grandson, again, in fiction we can do a lot, mm -hmm. he is the grandson of the, battle, the hero of the Battle of Stalingrad. So I mix in a whole bunch of Russian history, which we are completely unfamiliar with, and then this, the characters, and I'm gonna, I've created a little performance piece. Nice. A little bit similar, not actually nice. the, the exact words from the books, nice. and I, I've written a series, cool. so Sasha Perloff, the first one was Loose Ends, the second one is Death and Diamonds, mm -hmm. and just released mm -hmm. is The Terrorist, about oh, how nice. Sasha goes to a CIA prison in Eastern Europe, to interrogate someone who they believe to be a terrorist. Hmm. And so his mother was tortured. So they send him, uh, she was tortured by the Soviet authorities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So he, they send him because they know that he's not going to torture this woman. His mm -hmm. mother would never ever forgive him. Mm -hmm. So he sticks to those rules and that's sort of uh, how I, I run my stories. Did you notice that I tossed in Rasputin? I just yes, it. I yes, did it on purpose. Yes, and, yes. And uh, you sound like it sounds like you've done much what I've done because you have a background with mm -hmm. all of this stuff. Yes. And you got if you're going to write, you got to write stuff you know about. Right. And then things you're interested in, then you weave, then you do the weaving process, exactly. and, and that's what you've done with your books. Yes, exactly yeah. right. And and so I have of Russian descent. And actually, in this particular book, Sasha always goes and visits places mm -hmm. outside of the United States. So one of the stops he makes, this prison, is in outside of Minsk in Belarus, mm -hmm. what we call now Belarus. And my mother's family comes from there. Oh, yeah. So you, exactly right. So you um, weave in some stories that you might have heard. Mm -hmm. And also in, uh, in my characters... There's also the sense that I was involved with a whole bunch of Russians when they came to this country. Mm -hmm. You hear their stories, just like you've been hearing stories, mm -hmm. and you weave it in and create this character. Uh, now, maybe I'll play the part of an interviewer. You always do moral dilemmas. Yes. Do you not? Yes. Yeah. I, yes. I, I, yeah. Always. There's always got to be something because that's part of right. his character right. creation is, in right. fact, because his mother and father and grandfather and they had all these, mm -hmm. he has to live his history. Mm -hmm. So listen, we got so everybody, please, October twenty third, seven o'clock. Mm -hmm. You're going to go to a wonderful restaurant, the Malted Barley. You can drink beer, all kinds of beer, <laughs> wonderful pretzels. You can, you die for these pretzels; they're delicious. So come to the Malted Barley, which is on Forty Two High Street, downtown Wesley, Rhode Island. Wesley is a gorgeous little town to come and visit anyway. October twenty third, seven o'clock. I also want to give my kudos out to Colin Bennett, the owner of the Malted Barley for allowing us to do all this stuff. So thank you, Jim. We'll be together very thank soon. You, thank you, my audience. And this is Harriet Grayson, your host and producer of Community Culture Showcase.